you. So yes, uh, I'm a jack of all trades and master of none, so I can't claim to really know very much about salt making, uh, but I was involved in this project we called um, Solway Coastwise, which was a project managed by Solway First Partnership using place names as an inspiration to take a closer look at the Scottish Solway Coast and the stories behind the names which seem to be given to almost every rock and every landmark along the coast. The names we give to places help us describe a location to other people and in this way help us find both the physical, legendary and of course industrial landscape. Place names are usually a shorthand way of describing a place using just one or two words that identify places that are relevant to people who use them at the time. So we have a very small number, a handful of salty place names uh, on the southwest coast there. Um, and most of them on the inner Solway there and uh, I'll run through them all one by one and we can have a look. But they're, they're a really useful way of finding uh, salt pans when uh, physical remains and written records are so far and few between. So the first are these small mounds in the foreground here. Uh, they're marked on maps or are still known as salt cot hills. And uh, we're really fortunate to have the Reverend Henry Duncan's 1812 description of salt making process known as sleaching in the parishes of Ruthwell and Cummer Trees. Uh, medieval salt makers and later on, or salters, adopted this method of salt making in locations where natural evaporation concentrates the salt content on the shore. The salt laden surface, mud or sand, from high spring tide zone was known as sleach. In the summer, it was scraped off into heaps uh, onto the grass above high water mark to dry and then placed in pits and covered by peat or grass sods. Seawater was then added and the peat filtered the resulting brine which was then removed from the pits and stored in cisterns or carried directly to the salt pans. The salt pans were broad, shallow receptacles heated by peat fires in this um, example and the salt was then extracted through evaporation. To prevent the brine in the salt pans and cisterns from being diluted by rainfall, they were often covered or enclosed in a building known as a salt cot, hence salt cot hills. I think hills might be an exaggeration, but you can see that in this very um, flat landscape, then even these small mounds are described as hills. Once the salt was removed from the sleach, the spent mud and sand was then excavated out of the pits and cast aside, which created these mounds. And as they grew from mounds into hills, um, they became larger and larger. And the, the elevation of the mounds made them good locations to construct new filter pits and storage systems and salt pans themselves. However, the spent mud was also useful for improving peaty soils around the place. So this was probably very much a, a cottage industry and, and a very seasonal one. And so the people who ran these salt cots would also have been um, farming the, the land around them and would have used the, the spent sleach to improve the peaty ground around. And, and so these mounds, you would think that when there are a lot of salt pans in the area, which we think there were, um, but there aren't very many hills because most of it was probably spread on the, onto the ground. The next site is Southern S or Salt Makers Promontory. Southern S is a small village constructed in the 1760s around the base of this lighthouse. It was uh, erected to warn sailing ships approaching Dumfries of a rocky promontory. It is often said that the settlement was built as a coal mining village, but I think this is a misunderstanding of a reference in the statistical account where it's mentioned that the village was built for the coal business. Um, I think actually that it was more likely a landing place for imports rather than mining, although uh, the rocks here are of a carboniferous um, origin. Uh, the bringing in the coal may have been for the salt pans that were there or, or for the later lime kilns. 
Southerness appears to describe a southern point where Ness originates from the Old Norse word Ness, meaning promontory. The modern name is misleading because the medieval monastic manuscript shows that Southerness is a corruption of its old name, Salterness, meaning salt maker's promontory. The manufacturing process probably was initially uh, sleaching. Uh, certainly the site is suitable for that. But, uh, and, and we know from medieval records that uh, they were using initially uh, timber, um, but probably later peat, which were, is also close by, and then imported coal. Uh, the industrial operation has left no physical remains that we know of at the moment and we have to rely on the place name to, to locate the salt pan. The next location is Salt Pan Rocks. Uh, this is uh, next to Sandy Hills, a very popular uh, bay for holiday makers. And on the, on the Blouse map, it's actually marked as Salt Cots and as Salt Pan in Ruins on Ainsley's map of 1797. Uh, but is now known as Salt Pan Rocks. This is one of the few places where we have some possible uh, evidence of salt construction because this would appear to be a bucket pot um, at that site. Although there might, some, might be some doubt on that now, we know they should be somewhat larger. The next place uh, is Salt Flats at Rockcliffe. Um, this may have referred to, um, to Salt Flats as in, in the Merse, but I, I think here it's, it's quite a rocky landscape and it's more likely to be uh, referring to uh, a salt pan. And certainly there are uh, monast monastic manuscripts which refer to salt making in locations on the, south, on the west side of the River Ur and which this is uh, between the port and Pole Stewart Head. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to identify that location. So again, no evidence at all other than uh, the place name. Straying a lot further west and, and almost reaching uh, the Rins is Salt Pan Point at Port William. Um, and this can be confirmed as a salt making location from the Monreath estate records that show that it was rented in 1730 to a William Carsley for an annual rent of 28 pounds. But as part of our um, place name project, we looked at lots of different places and strayed off into all sorts of topics. And uh, Heston Island is particularly rich in interesting names. Uh, we have a tidal causeway here known as the Rack um, and names range from Daftan Steps to Needle's Eye which is also known as Elephant Rock which looks remarkably like an elephant. Um, but one of the other names is um, Monk's Pool and Monk's Pool is this area here which uh, is a fish trap, uh, an old fish trap um, enclosed on one side by uh, a boulder wall and asso associated presumably with monastic ownership. And the reason I mention that is because uh, in our discussions with local people, uh, one of the place names that came up was um, Monk's Hole. And Monk's Hole is not very easily seen here, is a natural um, rock pool here, but which has been as a boulder wall on this side here. So initially it was assumed to be another fish trap, although it didn't seem to be the most obvious place to have a fish trap. Uh, fish trap. Uh, so uh, we tried to do a little bit more investigation. And uh, in this rough sketch of the estate of Rascarol from 1780, now 1870, um, you can't very see very much at all. So if we zoom in though, we can see that on the coast there we have uh, three coal shafts and a salt pan. Uh, I suppose this is a, an unusual thing to find a, a salt pan marked on a map of, of 1870, long after salt pans were really in use. But the salt pan location does uh, match up identically with the, with the 
monk's pool. So we are hoping that that might be and a very much larger um, bucket pot, perhaps. Um, and also Rascarol salt pan does feature in salt records uh, in 1717, um, albeit a very small operation compared with other places. So here we see the location of Rascarol um, and the possibility of salt work remains and whetted our appetite for some place name associated archaeology and with the assistance of SCAPE we organised some community events. Uh, we first of all we um, went out with local people who pointed out uh, places of interest and this it became obvious was a very industrial landscape at one time. Um, we found uh, intertidal millstone quarries, there were Barites mines, copper mines and uh, of course we were very interested in trying to see if we could find evidence of the uh, salt pan as well. And there were certainly two structures close, well one very close to the, to the supposed bucket pot and one a little further away. So we organised some volunteers to do some surveying and, uh, and unfortunately, or in both cases, the buildings that we found had quite a lot of slag but what the slag um, showed that they were almost certainly smithies of blacksmiths and associated presumably uh, with the with the coal shafts and that evidence is is backed up by this this uh, map Ainsley's John Ainsley's 1797 map again where we can see uh, the coal pits but also a smithy and unfortunately no salt pan marked although the salt pan is about there So we have um, some other evidence of uh, Rascarol in, in letters and this is uh, from information or research published by Frances Wilkins in one of her many publications that has identified documents that shed further light on salt making in the Inner Solway. A letter from the local collector to the Board of Customs of Edinburgh in 1714 is responding to a request for further information on salt pans in the Dumfries area and it identifies only three salt pans, two coal-fired salt pans and one of which is, which is Rascarol and the other which is set up to work but has not been used for two years and is to the west of Rascarol, four miles when the tide is out or eight miles when the tide is in. So here we have um, the location of Rascarol and uh, the radius of four miles and as you can see when the tide is out then you can walk across the sands here uh, but when the tide is in then you have to walk all the way around here so um, four miles is shown roughly by that blue circle there um, it doesn't really quite reach the the known place names of uh, salt pans but it does just about reach salt flats and um, but none of the other locations. Although the ownership um, is, uh, the owners were identified as William Lindsay and Adam Crake, both of which uh, had estates uh, in this area here, but also owned land further down around this way. So it, it's, uh, we don't really know where that other salt pan was. Um, it could be salt flats, salt pan rocks, or, or somewhere else yet to be discovered. The third salt pan that was identified is a peat-fired salt pan using the sleaching method and is located at Priest's side. The letter reports that at one time there was a great number of salt pans in the area, but at this season this was the only one that's prepared to work and has already has peat stacked. A second letter, uh, which was written nearly 90 years later, concerns customs duty on salt in 1801. John Greer, George Johnson and John Porteous, owners of cart, horse and salt, were accused of non-payment of taxes. Their defence is that the salt was made at Priestside and Cockpool 
and that an act of 1661 exempted them from paying duty. This um, was believed to be because it was such a cottage industry and such small amount of salt was made and it was of such low quality that uh, they were given exemption from paying tax. And in fact, it's that lack of uh, tax records which makes it difficult to know how much salt was being manufactured on the inner Solway. But according to the claimant in this case, it was stated for that for the last 120 years, so, so that's between 1661 and 1781, that the quantity of salt made was never of any considerable amount. But since that time, in favourable seasons, between 40 and 50 tonnes of salt have been made annually. And it states that in the last year in particular, so that's in 1800, the amount was 200 tonnes. This is quite an enormous uh, increase um, and it may be a, a way of avoiding um, taxes on smuggled salt. Salt was certainly coming in um, from other places, from Ireland and the Isle of Man and perhaps it was a way of passing off that salt. Uh, maybe they had developed a better way of making salt. Uh, maybe, um, as mentioned earlier by a speaker, it was improved production due to imported rock salt, which made that production much more. In any case, uh, no, no more information on that case has been found, so I don't know whether they were found guilty or not, or whether they had to pay taxes. So that's the location there of Preside and Cockpool, and it's certainly um, from the Reverend Henry Dun Duncan's report, we know that uh, that site eastwards, that there are a large number of, of salt pans uh, using the sleaching method, um, but there really isn't very much physical evidence at all to come by. Um, and as has been mentioned earlier, it really was a precarious method of making salt. It relied very much on hot summers, and um, it may have gone up and down in production over those years. So really an awful lot more work to do and hopefully maybe a few more records will cast light and encourage us to go out and have a look for more sites. Thank you.